Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Lorene Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. Our guest today is Paul Barnes, an editor, film editor extraordinaire. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. My pleasure to be here. Well, we are here to anticipate and to celebrate the release on PBS starting September 17th mm -hmm. of a series that you worked for 10 years on mm -hmm. called The Vietnam War. Yes. Um, this was probably one of the most complicated and complex projects that Ken ever undertook. Ken Burns. Ken Burns. And Lynn Novick. And uh, his co-director, Lynn Novick, who was also co-producer, and co-producer co Sarah Botstein. The three of them were the driving forces behind this series. I was only an editor on this one. Uh, and our great writer, of course, Jeffrey C. Ward. Um, but they were the ones behind the conception of it, and they're the ones who were working for 10 years uh, putting the whole thing together. The editing actually only took five and a half years, so. Well, um, so you wor you've worked with Ken for how many years? Uh, over 24, since 1984, actually. What does that add up to in years? 34 years? 34 years. Well, your most recent project before this was the Roosevelt, yes. a sublime piece of work. But Thank name you. some of the other ones that you've worked on. Uh, I worked on the Civil War. I worked on baseball. I worked on jazz. I worked on the national parks. Um, I worked on Unforgivable Blackness. Um, you got an Emmy for that, didn't you? Yes, I did. Yes. yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Stephen Ambrose, who's a historian, says that more Americans get their history from Ken Burns and from any other source. Yeah. Well, thank goodness they're getting their history, and they're getting it at a very high quality level. Mm -hmm. But the, yes. It, it actually, it's something I'm very, very proud of. I mean, I'm retired now, um, but the body of work that, that Ken has produced, um, going all the way back to Brooklyn Bridge, is really extraordinary. Um, and, and the fact that we've been able to maintain a high quality on every single piece all the way through is something I'm very, very proud of uh, from working with him. Um, and, and I do feel, I'm, I'm so happy that the projects and, and his films are so popular. Um, the amount of fans we have all across the country, uh, and it covers a broad spectrum of people, is just extraordinary. Um, there's no place that we go that we don't encounter people once they, they, you know, they recognize Ken, they don't know me, but once they, they, they hear I've worked with him, you know, they start to talk about so many of the shows that they've watched and enjoyed and what they got from them, and it's quite extraordinary. Um, I'd like to ask you why he finally chose this project. He did say one thing about why it was important to do now. He said the seeds of disunion we experience today, the polarization, the lack of civil discourse, all had their seeds in Vietnam. I can't imagine a better way to help pull out some of the fuel rods that create this radioactive atmosphere than to talk about Vietnam in a calm way. Absolutely. I mean, that was the whole basis for why he wanted to do it. Um, he has seen uh, really the, the beginnings of the red state, blue state America started in Vietnam. Um, and he figured that, you know, it, it's about time we start to have discourse about this and try to come together in some way and, and, and solve this divide, uh, which seems to be growing larger instead of, in, instead of, of getting smaller. Uh, and it concerns him a great deal. And he thought Vietnam would be the perfect vehicle um, to do that to have a calm discussion about that war and, and, and its many flaws and its, uh, it, it's it, you know, the, the many good intentions behind it, uh, discuss the whole thing. Um, one of the brilliant things about the series for me is that it, it triangulates the story between the United States, South Vietnam, and North Vietnam. Um, and, and to Lynn Novick and Sarah Botstein's credit, they pushed Ken hard to interview the North and South Vietnamese uh, veterans of the war, uh, only because they felt that it, it broadened the whole perspective of, of what the war was all about to understand um, these people that, that we had basically gone into their country and you know, um, were trying to dictate to them the way in which they should live. Um, and it was important to get their point of view. And I think when viewers see them, they'll be quite taken with the interviews from the North Vietnamese and the South Vietnamese with their take on what it meant to them, the war. Uh, there are 79 on-screen interviews, right. most of which Lynn had done, right? Is that? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting that it's a kind of ground-up 
view of the war, she explained that there were sort of two, a couple of ground rules, which is not to have experts or talking heads or mm -hmm. historians, so you don't have Seymour Hirsch talking about My Lai, mm -hmm. and uh, not to have the famous figures that suck up all the oxygen, uh, McCain, Jane Fonda, Henry Kissinger, just to have it from the point of view. I'd like to show uh, one little, we'll start with a clip by uh, Vincent o Okamoto. Tell me about him a little bit. Uh, Vincent Okamoto is a remarkable man, I think. He's, uh, again, he, he went into the war fully believing that it, it, it had a good cause and a good purpose. And once he went through what he went through there, um, his, he came back you know, with his mind changed uh, and really questioning whether the government was right to intervene in the way in which they had intervened. Um, you know, but he was an incredibly brave soldier. You'll, you'll see the sequence in the film. Um, he has amazing respect for the men uh, who, who uh, were under his charge. Um, he's gone on to become, you know, a judge in California, which is, he's had a really remarkable career. Uh, but he's one of the best spokesmen, I think, in, in the entire film. Well, let's take a look. This is a clip called Men Like This. Let's look at it for a minute. Mm -hmm. You know what? The, the real heroes are the men that died. 19, 20-year-old high school dropouts. They didn't have escape routes that the elite and the, the wealthy and the privileged had. And that was unfair. And so they looked upon military services like the weather. You had to go in and you'd do it. But to see these kids who had the least to gain, there wasn't anything to look forward to. They were going to be rewarded for their service in Vietnam. And yet, their infinite patience, their loyalty to each other, their courage under fire uh, was just phenomenal. And you would ask yourself, how, how does America produce young men like this? To what he says about, we always thought courage was standing up under fire or charging a bunker. Mm -hmm. But for these young people, you know, just out of high school, if that, mm -hmm. um, to display the courage and the loyalty and, and, you know, like he says, it's like the weather. You just have to get through this. Mm -hmm. I just found that a really moving scene. And it puts you right back again with, those, with the soldiers at the bottom, the routine soldiers who answered the call with such courage mm -hmm. and grace. Right, exactly. Uh, but also then, you know, uh, took amazingly good care of, of each other, uh -huh. um, you know, under the most horrible of circumstances. Um, and I think that's one reason why Vincent says, you know, how is it that America can produce these kinds of young men uh, of this kind of courage? And uh, another aspect of what you all seem to try to do in this series I am astonished at how even-handed it is, mm -hmm. almost to the point of, well, well, we'll show a clip in a minute, but even in the sponsorship, you had the Ford Foundation, Rockefeller, but you had David Cook, too. Mm, right. So you had both sides, and then in terms of, of, of people giving their point of view on different events, and it's not just one side than the other and they've got a balance but it's a really fair distribution of many perspectives at the one of the on the on the posters for the vietnam war project it says there is no single truth about mm -hmm. war and another part that we're going to show a clip in a minute of some of the protests and the voice uh, well tell me who bill zimmerman is and who james willibanks is Certainly. Um, uh, Bill Zimmerman was uh, um, an ardent anti-war activist. Um, really, he was at the very beginnings of the anti-war movement. The first uh, demonstration that Bill attended, he remembered, only 15 people showed up. <laughs> and initially, that was incredibly discouraging to him. But then over the over years, he, he saw the movement grow and grow. Um, James Willibanks uh, was a military man, uh, very much committed to the war in Vietnam, still believes that we fought it, you know, for good reasons. Um, and so it's, you know, they're both from opposing camps in terms of what, what, the, what the war was all about and, and whether it was worth fighting or not. And in terms of the single truth, uh, when you did the program about jazz, Wynton Marsalis, I can only paraphrase this, is able to clearly say sometimes a thing and the opposite of a thing 
are true at the same time. Right, exactly. And so what I love is that nobody's coming in and adding up the points for this side or that side and saying, you win. It's just like, let's look at it this way and this way. And so let's look at this clip of the protests in, uh, I think, 1969 in Washington, D.C. It right. starts with uh, Bill Zimmerman, the anti-war protester, and then it shows James Willibanks, an army advisor. Let's take a look. I never considered the Vietnamese our enemy. They had never done anything to threaten the security of the United States. They were off 10,000 miles away, minding their own business. And we went there to their country, told them what kind of government we wanted them to have. Well, when I, I see the war protesters, I react on a couple of levels. Intellectually, I certainly understand their right to the freedom of speech, but I will tell you that when I see them waving NLF flags, the, the enemy that I and my friends had to fight, and some of my friends had to die fighting, that doesn't sit very well with me. On November 15, 1969, half a million citizens turned out against the war in Washington again. This time, buses provided an impenetrable wall around the White House. President Nixon claimed he was too busy watching football on television to pay attention. But he did suggest that Army helicopters might be used to blow out the marchers' candles. Hundreds of thousands of others demonstrated in San Francisco and New York. Well, what does that make you feel for me to see the, the size of that crowd and the buses lined up around right. the White House? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really extraordinary. I mean, I, I don't think the country was ever galvanized and in, in any other American historical event they were the, the way they were galvanized by the Vietnam War. Um, and the, the fact that it kept growing in momentum as the war was grinding on is really remarkable. Um, in another uh, anti-war sequence, you know, someone talks about how Initially, the movement was all hippies and radicals, and everybody, you know, was down on them and, and, and uh, you know, thought they were, they were too far to the left. And then as the war ground on and people became more and more convinced that it uh, was a useless thing that we were doing, the middle class started to join. Um, and the, the crowds who came to these demonstrations and, and protests, you know, started to change, and it was middle-class housewives and ministers and, you know, people from the civil rights movement and uh, children and, and, you know, preppy uh, college kids. Um, the, 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 you could really feel there was an amazing cross-section of the country uh, that was growing more and more um, concerned about what this war was causing to their country. And that concern was a result of the role of the press in this war. It was the first television war. Yes, indeed. Talk about the role of the press. Yeah. I mean, I think it was a golden age of television journalism. Mm. Um, they had lightweight cameras at that point, uh, 16 millimeter, uh, which allowed them to really go into the field and right up to the front lines with the men and to actually capture what was going on right in front of their eyes. Um, and, you know, once they saw what was happening there, you know, it opened up an awful lot of questions. And uh, CBS and NBC and ABC, to their credit, were not afraid to air these, these segments. Um, and every night on the nightly news, people would be having their dinner and watching this war at home. Um, and, and again, many of the American people had faith in their government, faith in their leaders, and thought this was right. But the more they kept seeing these reports about all the things that were going wrong over there, um, they were really, it really opened up a big, um, uh, you know, they really started to question, you know, what, what is right and wrong here and what we're doing. We're speaking today with Paul Barnes, who is an editor on the beautiful PBS series, that beautiful, powerful PBS series, The Vietnam War. We're talking about the role of the press. It was also very dangerous for the press. There weren't over 200 r reporters and photographers killed. Yes, absolutely. I mean, because they were so brave and courageous and because they wanted to get right up on the front lines, um, they often got caught in the middle of horrible firefights. And so many photographers, uh, many press, uh, print journalists were, were killed in, in the line of action. Um, there's a remarkable sequence in the film during Tet when, you know, you see one of the reporters lay, laying on the ground who's been shot in the leg. 
uh, he survived, but others did not. Um, the newspapers and the press helped examine the political aspect of this. Mm -hmm. Speak to this briefly. There were five presidents who prolonged this war. Right. And by the way, we're, we're seeing it 50 years after the height of the war. The war went from, say, 45 to 75. Can we mm -hmm. roughly say that? So it's 50 years ago, the height of the war. And we're finally right. taking off the blinders, taking a deep breath, and looking at what happened. Right. But how much... It's a very painful examination of the role of politics and politicians yeah. in this. Yeah. Uh, I mean, one of the most awful things to me in, in, in working on the film was really discovering that every single president was more concerned about being reelected than really examining uh, whether the war was correct or not. Um, and during that period of time, more and more young Americans kept dying um, for a war that, you know, many people were beginning to believe was, was totally wrong. You know, but Kennedy was saying, you know, I, I don't want to get out of Vietnam until I get reelected. Uh, Johnson was saying the same thing uh, until he was actually courageous enough at least to say I'm not going to run anymore because basically this war destroyed his presidency. And then Nixon was the same way. It's like, you know, we can't pull out and, uh, before I get reelected in 72. I mean, it was always at the forefront of their concerns seemed to be their reelections and not the, the loss of life over there. And when you think that that is the biggest thing that a politician is thinking about in terms of life and death of these young Americans, it's disgusting to me. Um, and every single one of them did it. And they're both parties. This both is not, parties. not a partisan issue. It's, it's an issue of power. Right. Yes. Um, I watched all 18 hours. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I was so moved. The last episode is called The Weight of memory, mm -hmm. and the title of the episode is from Tim O'Brien, who is a writer, yes. who wrote a, a wonderful book, The Things They Carried, mm -hmm. and he said, it, this is just from the book, they shared the weight of memory, they took up what others could no longer bear, often they carried each other, and so I'd like to show a clip from Tim O'Brien, this is in the at the end, um, he's he talks about how landmines were responsible for 80% of the casualties. And the courage is not so much, you know, charging the barricades, but for him it was taking step by step, village to village, in this landmine-infested territory. Let's just take a look. He says it better than I can. Thank you. Somewhere around 80% of our casualties came from landmines of all sorts. In Vietnam, for me, just to get up in the morning and look out at the land and think in a few minutes I'll be walking out there and will my corpse be there or there? Will I lose a leg out there? I'd always thought of courage as charging enemy bunkers or standing up under fire, but just to walk through Quang Nai day after day from village to village and through the paddies and up into the mountains. Just to make your legs move was an act of courage that if say you were living in Sioux City, it wouldn't be courageous to walk to the grocery store or down Main Street. They'd just have your legs go back and forth. But in Vietnam for me, just to walk felt incredibly brave. I I would sometimes look at my legs as I walk, thinking, how am I doing this? That, to me, is so powerful. We don't think of the courage of oh. walking in where you can be blown to bits at any right. minute. I know. I mean, that was a, an extraordinary piece of his interview. I mean, again, I think Tim is one of the best interviews in the film. Yes. But that particular piece, just about the act of walking, which took so much courage for him to do on a daily basis, is just remarkable. It's, it is hard to think about. I mean, he talks about, you know, how easy it is to walk around an American city. You don't even think you're walking. You know, but when you're in Vietnam with all the dangers inherent in going out there, it's like one step in front of the other. You don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, and he'd say, and that's, well, yeah. that's a daily concern. I mean, yeah. he had to live with that day after day after day after day. And this was actually a man who did not want to go. And the only reason why he basically went to the Vietnam War was because he thought all of his neighbors back home would look down on him um, if he didn't do his duty as an American citizen and go and fight this war. Mm. Well, he left us his book, The Things They Carried, is really a, a powerful piece, and he is another one of my favorites. You have another favorite, that we don't have a clip from this time, but we will because mm -hmm. we're going to revisit this. Yes. Tell me about your favorite interview subject. 
Uh, John Musgrave, who was a Marine, uh, who was from a, a little town outside of Indianapolis, um, he is, I think, next to Shelby Foote, maybe the greatest interview that we've ever conducted in any of our films. Um, and, and John was horribly wounded uh, in Vietnam, almost died, um, luckily survived, uh, came back, and has been working with veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan and trying to deal with their PTSD. Uh, John almost committed suicide twice. Um, and again, he was a young man who was brought up, you know, in a small community, a Boy Scout, a Christian. His father was in the military. His father was in the military. He admired all the vets of World War II. He wanted to be like them. That's why he went to Vietnam. And when he went there and saw what a morass it was, um, he just he couldn't reconcile uh, those two things in his head. You know, the patriotism that he felt, and 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 then the, you know, the way in which the war was being conducted and why it was being conducted. He really questioned hard. Um, and uh, he, he wound up joining uh, Vietnam veterans against the war after the second suicide attempt because he finally said, enough is enough. I have to speak out and finally say what I saw over there and how I feel about it, and I have to bring this war to an end because I can't see any more of my young brothers die. That's how strongly John felt about it. One thing that we see, and, and we're going to revisit this in the future, we will have some clips from him, but... I think it's so important for people to get the tone and the tenor mm -hmm. of these clips. These are just ordinary people yes. talking. Yes. Very perceptive, right. very honest and articulate people. Yes. I, I, I think the vets, um, I think that the ones who agreed to be interviewed, what they've given us is a great gift uh, because they're open and they're honest and, and they tell it. They tell the unvarnished truth, the unvarnished feeling about what they went through uh, as they saw it, as they lived through it. Um, and, and, you know, for many years, Vietnam was the war we're not supposed to talk about. It was supposed to be left silent and just, you know, let's ignore it, let's forget about it. Uh, it was a disaster for this country and, and we should just not even think about it anymore. And many of the vets, I think, felt hamstrung. Uh, when they came back home, they were looked down upon. Uh, many of them were called baby killers, and they didn't want to wear their uniform because they got abused in public if, if they were in their uniforms. And so they just they clammed up, uh, and all of that was held in uh, uh, held inside. And I think was one of the reasons why there were so many suicides and 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 uh, uh, cases of PTSD associated with that war. Um, and, and you know, and finally, it takes an awful lot of courage to just say, you know, I've got to tell my truth. And I think for many of these people, the, the film allowed them to do that, to finally sit down and reflect back on what they went through and to tell their stories honestly. Um, many of them opened up and told us things they'd never told anybody else before because they felt it was an opportunity. Um, and, and just because they did that, I mean, it's a great gift to the American public to finally hear their honesty about what happened. And those are among the things they carried inside that they couldn't, T tell anybody where they were, the things they'd seen, they'd come home to the wife and kids, right. never talk about it. And we were, you know, I knew many of those, never, you can never mention it, just do not. But they did a wonderful thing from that because the Vietnam vets were passionate about making sure that the Iraq War vets and Desert Storm vets, that they were treated that was always honor the warrior, even yes. if you don't like the war, yes. you have to honor the warrior. And this, yeah. this, your program, this series, truly honors the warrior. I, I hope I hope that it does, and it's part of the reason why we made it. You know, was to give them some due respect and honor for what they went through. Now, um, the last part with the withdrawal agreement and Nixon resigning and the abandonment of our South Vietnamese allies. Uh, even Walter Cronkite says <clears throat> we're at the end of the tunnel, and there is no light there. It was a messy end to a messy war. We're running out of time. I just want to talk about the notes of redemption that you end this whole 10 episode mm -hmm. series with. Your part on the Vietnam Memorial, which was opened in 1982, right. the reconciliation and the healing, and your favorite guy, Musgrave, says, you know, he didn't go, but when he went, he would collapse yes. sobbing. And he said, this is going to save lives when right. people see all 58,000 yeah. names. Right. The, the wall is, is, is a brilliant memorial. It really is. Um, it's, it's, it's one of my two favorite American monuments. Next to the Statue of Liberty, it's the wall. Uh, and they're almost polar opposites. The Statue of Liberty represents everything that's best about this country. And the wall, in many ways, represents the worst about this country. Maya Lin's 
design is, is just extraordinary. I mean, this black granite wall with every single name of those who died etched into it. Um, and, and it's dug into the ground so that it goes down into the earth. Uh, there's nothing uh, uplifting about it whatsoever. Uh, it's just bold, blunt, and incredibly beautiful. And I had the same reaction when I first saw it. Not that I went through the war, um, but it brought me to tears. And I've been there many times, and every time I go, it still does. It, I cut that scene, and it was very hard for me to cut it because oh, of the emotions involved. It's so powerful. I, I was crying. It right. was just, but we're almost out of time. Um, there's a whole part of the normalization of Vietnam where the vets went back and they worked yes. with schools and planting trees. And even Obama, when he went, said, we've shown that hearts can change mm -hmm. and that we can put the past behind us. Another writer said, we can get closure. We may not get closure, but we can get peace. Right. What is your, how do you want our viewers to approach this series? And, and it, do you think it will change hearts and minds? Uh -huh. Well, I'm, I'm, I really do hope that it will. I mean, it's the kind of, of, of reconciliation that the vets were looking for, uh, the kind of peace they were looking for when they went back to Vietnam. Um, I think we're hoping the series might do the same for the American public, um, to really recognize the universality of uh, uh, the, the emotions and the sufferings that, that people go through in, in warfare. Uh, and because of the honesty, again, of the South Vietnamese and the North Vietnamese voices, they're so akin to the American voices. I mean, it's like they are brothers. And when the vets went back, you know, they were happy to meet the North Vietnamese uh, soldiers that they had fought against. You know, they were embracing them. They were telling each other stories about common sufferings that they had gone through during this war. I mean, and by the end, many friendships were formed. Uh, you know, they were embracing each other like, like, like brothers were. I mean, they were brother soldiers, basically. Uh, and, and that's a remarkable kind of a thing. Um, and in some way, if, if, if the red and blue in this country can watch this show and think hard about, you know, these, these divisions that have, that have occurred, if there's some way to have a discussion and, and, and to try to come to some kind of reconciliation about these issues that are dividing us so deeply, uh, which had their roots in the Vietnam War, that would be a wonderful thing if that was one of the end results of the series. Well, we are going to continue this discussion shortly once people have had a chance to see maybe the first week because mm -hmm. it uh, starts September 17th. Yes. It's two hours a night, well, four hours a night. Each segment is, is played repeated. twice, repeated. Yeah. And so um, I look forward to having you back soon. We can discuss okay. this further. But thank you. This is a monumental achievement, and, uh, and it's a tremendous gift to the nation. Thank you. Uh, my pleasure. Our guest today is Paul Barnes, and I'm Lorene Mills. I'd like to thank you, our audience, for being with us today on Report from Santa Fe. We'll see you next week. Past archival programs of Report from Santa Fe are available at the website reportfromsantafe.com. If you have questions or comments, please email info at reportfromsantafe.com. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.